Hi there, everyone. Back again. It is Adam Leventhal, and alongside me is John McKenzie. How are you? Hello. Is that it? Just a hello? Yes. yes. How are you? You good? <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. We are recording remotely for this uh, podcast edition because we had to take in every last moment of this bumper Premier League midweek match day session. Um, and it is uh, good to be able to sort of chew it over with uh, with yourself, John. Mark Critchley is here as well. How are you, Mark? I'm good, thank you, Adam. How are you? Very good. Very good. It was a busy, busy evening for Manchester United, wasn't it, on Thursday? Uh, slightly busy. Most of the games are quite busy now. You might have noticed that they concede about 50 shots a game or something. <laughs> yeah, so so busy on uh, both ends, if you like. And, and certainly um, that was that was a game that just defined and typified the way that United are playing at the moment. Yeah, we'll get stuck into Chelsea for Manchester United 3 on this show, of course, and kick ahead to the weekend uh, against Liverpool once again. Andy Jones is here as well to make up our trio. How are you, Andy? I'm very good, thank you. Very good. Excellent. It's good to have you on board, ready for a big, big weekend. Uh, let's run you through the fixture formation. It's a 7-3 Saturday-Sunday setup. Uh, Saturday, 12.30. All of these times are British summertime, uh, just to let you know if you're listening around the world. Uh, Palace against Manchester City. That's at 12.30. Then you've got five, three o'clocks on Saturday. Villa against Brentford. Fulham, Newcastle. Luton, Bournemouth. Wolves against West Ham. And then the Sean Dyche derby. Everton against Burnley. Then at 5.30, it's Brighton, Arsenal. Then on Sunday, back to Old Trafford. Back to Manchester United hosting Liverpool. But obviously this time it is in the league. Then it is Sheffield United against Chelsea at 5.30 and Spurs Forest at 6. A little bit quirky. Right, let's get stuck into the action. So after everything we've seen this week, this is how we look at the top of the table. Liverpool top with 70 points. Arsenal 68. Manchester City on 67. And we're going to start the show by looking at the leaders who go to Old Trafford for a fixture that we witnessed just, what, three weeks ago in the FA Cup, that seven-goal thriller won by Manchester United, Ama Diallo scoring in the last minute of extra time. Neutrals will obviously be hoping for a similar scoreline on Sunday, another sort of spectacular clash. Both of these teams played on Thursday night. United, as we mentioned, lost 4-3 against Chelsea in a just a crackers game at Stamford Bridge. In terms of where you see this, Mark, was that the worst possible way for, for United to prepare for such a, an important game at the weekend? Uh, well, it's certainly not the best possible way. Um, I think, look, it's the way that we expect United to lose at the minute. Uh, it's <laughs> the way that we expect them to play. Um, there's this frenetic pace. There's this absence of control. There are moments of brilliance. Um, but they live at the margins. They, they rely on whether... <laughs> they they score as many of the shots that they have and produce um more than the opposition put all the shots that they get away that's these insane games that we've been seeing that's the story of them and in that respect it probably isn't that different from from the Liverpool FA Cup game that we had 3 weeks ago right it was just that they fell on the wrong side of the margin this time um i think look last week Ten Hag said that United games are becoming like tennis matches. And he said, you know, if you want to go and watch a tennis match, go to Wimbledon. But like watching that game last night, I could have been sat there with a bowl of strawberries and cream because it was a tennis match. It was it was a basketball match. It was a great football match at the same time um, as, as an entertainment spectacle. But playing in this style is not a way to achieve consistent results. And you look at the position that United are in now heading into this game. Uh, nine points off Tottenham in fifth. They're 11 behind Villa. Uh, they've got a game in hand. But I had a look on Opta's supercomputer this morning um, and it was coming out with about a 5% chance of either finishing fourth or fifth, which, you know, we, we expect will be, but even, even fifth might not be enough for the Champions League. But about 5%. If they lose this weekend, you can see that that quickly approaching zero, right? If if Villa and Tottenham's results go, go the other way. So I just, look... 
it's uh, the, the, the place United are in at the minute. And you, you could make an argument that they're really quite lucky to be sixth, never mind looking further up the table. I mean, Chelsea were 12th at kickoff last night. They're now 10th. They're five points behind United with a game in hand. <laughs> who's to say who's to say United are going to finish as high as six by the, by the time it all shakes out? Uh, that's just the place that they're in at the minute, a chaotic team that you never know what to expect, it's, apart from the fact that it's probably going to be entertaining. And John, just put into context the, the statistic that we, you know, everyone has now seen that Manchester United this year have conceded the most shots of any team, which is 225. Uh, just try and put it into some sort of context. Yeah, well, it's uh, Eric Ten Hag talking about this This topic is very much like the Tim Robinson sketch where he's in the, the hamburgers, the, what's that, it's hot dog suit, isn't it? Where he's saying... You know, we're still trying to find the guy who did this um, because Manchester United are conceding an incredible amount of shots and he seems very unconconcerned by it. But it's an issue. He's above, you know, above everyone, above teams in the same range as Brentford, Sheffield United, West Ham, teams who have been struggling defensively um, across the season. And, you know, we spent a lot of time talking in the last few days about the, the game versus Arsenal Man City compared to the Manchester United versus Chelsea game, one being very entertaining, the other one not. And the reason why one game was entertaining and the other one wasn't is because one, one game was between two teams who were very good at stopping oppositions from generating chances. So Manchester City and Arsenal uh, have, have have conceded 98 for Man City and 77 shots for, for Arsenal. So if you want to do well, if you want to be consistently near the top of the table, what you have to do is stop oppositions from, from having chances. And there are people who've been arguing, well, Manchester United's expected goals per shot conceded is is third lowest in the league um what i would say to that is that yes it is but that you know the 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 actual variance between the, those um those different values is very small so it goes from between i think 0 0.08 uh, for arsenal per shot conceded which um is very low it's much lower than than everyone else anyway uh, and then i think around 0 0.12 for for villa so what we're talking about here is the difference between quantity versus a difference between quality because over 100 shots manchester united will be conceding on average around uh, i think it's uh, 10 expected goals now the the league average is around 11 expected goals so they are conceding when they are conceding 100 chances compared to the rest of the league, they are conceding slightly less expected goals in total. But the problem is, is that they're conceding, you know, they've conceded 100 shots more than the, the next closest team in the top five, which is, uh, you know, 100 shots at 0 0.1 is, is, again, another 10 expected goals. So, yes, they're saving one expected goal across 100 shot samples compared to Spurs, for example. But because they're conceding 100 shots more, that means they're putting up 10 XG more uh, in, in the same sort of uh, uh, time period as well. So this is a problem. And whichever way Eric Ten Hag wants to look at it, if you consider, if you consistently concede these kind of chances, these number of chances, you're going to get punished in the Premier League because the, the 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 quality that is on offer in the league is such that you know you don't need to generate huge amounts of great chances in order to um, score lots of goals. So yeah, lots of problems for Manchester United here. And Mark, is this just an issue of of personnel at the moment, especially in defence, because they've got they've got clear issues going into the game uh, against Liverpool, but they've been they've been struggling for consistency in that defensive line all season, haven't they? Yeah, so obviously last night you saw Rafael Varane come off uh, with an injury for the second game running. Um, you saw Johnny Evans come back from injury, come on at halftime as a substitute, play 15 minutes and then have to go off himself. So those two will now be a doubt for, for Liverpool on Sunday. You've already got um, Victor Lindelof and Lissandro Martinez confirmed this week out for a month. So that really leaves United in in that in the centre of defence with just two options, Harry Maguire and uh, Willie Cambuala, who's the 19-year-old French centre-back who I thought actually came on and acquitted himself quite well last night, as much as anyone did. Um, but it, United have had, I think, I think it's a, a 11 different centre-back partnerships this season that have started games. Um, I don't think Maguire and Cambuala have, have started one together, so that'll be the 12th if they start on Sunday. And I, I saw a stat as well that that starting partnership of centre-backs has only finished nine of 30 games this season. That's the lowest in the league of any team. So you're seeing, in, whether it's injury or the need to rotate, players are having, you've got inconsistency at the base of that defence. And I think that explains partly why they've been conceding so many shots as well this season, right? If you don't have that stability and that and that trust in the relationships. Um, but yeah, but 
United's injury problems have been something that have been consistent all season. They have affected the defence a little bit more than other areas of the team. And I think it's a I think it's a multifaceted problem. You know, I, I, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of attention this week and a lot of talk about Eric Ten Hag's training sessions. And and we know, I think, from you know, our own reporting on the athletic as well, training sessions are hard. Players talk about it. Day after games, those who haven't played have to come in and work in an extra hard session, a recovery session. I'm putting it air quotation marks. It doesn't sound like much of a recovery to me. So, yes, there's that. Just look at the games themselves, the way they play, how fast, how frenetic he is, the the space that they have to cover. This is all stuff that leads into niggles and injuries that you're going to pick up during the season. And one thing we've seen is that it's the same players getting injured over and over again. So, well, I think it's... um. It's a it's a it's a bigger question, United's injury crisis, but it's one that's been consistent throughout the season, and and yeah, it's a real you know, uh, it, it's it's going to harm their harm their chances of of making a, a positive end to the season because uh, because they just simply don't have that consistency in personnel. And just a quick one, Mark, because before I bring Liverpool into the into the conversation, um, in terms of what we're hearing, or the, there are sounds around how Jim Radcliffe is is feeling about what he is seeing on the field what's your understanding of it do you think that this is just a sort of a slow burn towards Eric Ten Hag just picking up his cardboard box clearing his desk and then they move on to someone who they actually really fancy or 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 do you not think it's quite as clearly defined as that I think it's still a little early to say it's clearly defined and to say that any sort of decision has been definitively made but look what I would caveat with that with saying is that um, well, think about how we were feeling like three weeks ago after the after the Liverpool quarterfinal game. I remember doing a podcast, coming on this podcast, and we were talking about all the reasons why Ineos might want to keep Ten Hag. You know, at that point, United were feeling very positive. It was probably the most positive United have felt about the season all season. Um, and he had that kind of two-week period of grace, if you like. Um, but <laughs> and now the feeling is very different, right? Just two games since then, and, and it's completely flipped reversed. I think that in itself shows why Ineos's decision needs to be thorough. It needs to be deliberate. It can't react to these games that oscillate between great performances and wild results and, and then heavy defeats and loads of shots conceded. They need a thorough, considered approach. That's what they've always said they will do. And yes, these results will be informing opinions. Um, I think the, the two this week, I think the Fulham game last month, these these are games that have gone away that just again we we bring up the word unsustainable. Ten Hag might feel that he deserves a chance under a new structure, and to be honest, look, it's always been the structure that's been the problem at United, right? Whenever they've made managerial changes in the past, there's maybe been a short term bounce, but it hasn't worked out in the long term. If you're going to finally change that structure, maybe there's an argument for keeping the manager, but he is. The performances that United are putting in, the lack of consistency isn't helping him. It isn't helping his cause whatsoever. And um, yeah, I think, look, that decision is going to be made in, in, in the weeks and months to come. Let's bring Andy in on the on the conversation. Um, one of our team of, of Liverpool writers here on The Athletic. Liverpool in action had a bit of a scare on Thursday night against Sheffield United, but but came through it as people would have expected in the end, um, in terms of the the feeling at Liverpool, I suppose you you can contrast it to Manchester United and looking towards the end of the season and potential managerial change. We know that there's going to be managerial ch- change at, at Liverpool with Jurgen Klopp leaving. Do you think that the performances are reflecting just that collective spirit that they need to get this title for him and they will get the title for him? I think there's it's definitely a big element of it. I think it helps that almost everyone has just got this this same common goal. You know, you've you've not got the 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 sort of the longer term future is for other people to deal with, and this this set of players and this coaching staff is very much, um, you know, these we've got eight eight league games left and potentially five Europa League games left. So that you know, there's no. Well, what are we going to do in the transfer market for for Jurgen Klopp to think about in the summer? You know what? You know what's the preseason plans and all this type of stuff. He's just got a very common. You know, he's just got that one goal. Uh, two, if if you want to talk about both trophies, um, but obviously the league is 
is the one that I think Liverpool fans it's fair to say would want a lot more than the Europa League. Um and yet it is it's I think it is sort of it's brought that that sense of you know this this one's for the boss type thing and we've heard a lot of of, of talk from Liverpool players about uh, the last dances that you know that that quote has, has been doing the rounds again um as it has been a few times in the last sort of 12 months or so um and and it is it's it, it's 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 winning it for him i think that's what it feels like um because while you know Klopp has been sensational it, it would almost feel unfair i think for him to only have left with with one premier league title given you know the, the battles that they've had with man city and how competitive they've been against the team that you know is you know should in, in many other seasons would have wiped the floor with with everybody so um i think it is that and i think you can see that in in the the mentality of the players and and you know every setback or pretty much every setback they've had this season they've bounced back in and it, Go back to the comebacks and it's seven in in the Premier League so far this season where they've they've been a goal down and and come come from behind to win and you know twelve months ago we were looking at this Liverpool side who um you know that had gone that disappeared um and so the the change has has been you know dramatic and incredible in a way of how quickly it's changed but um yeah it's 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 a united group that are, are you know we're all pointing in one direction and that's. I think Trent Alexander Arnold spoke uh, recently and, and sort of said that once Klopp had shared the news with the team, Van Dijk was very much, you know, the, the captain and and he took control and sort of basically said we've got to do this for for him. Um, and you can just see that in in the energy and the crowd feel the same. Um, everyone's pulling in in that direction to to try and get, you know, send Jurgen Klopp off in the uh, in the perfect way. Just a quick word on on um, Mo Salah. Obviously, there was a, a little bit of unrest, minor unrest. You know, walking back to the the bench against Sheffield United, not looking happy, not necessarily looking directly at Jurgen Klopp, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. People make more of it um, than maybe we should. Um, but it did sort of make sense, didn't it? He scored three in his last four. You've got a big game against Manchester United coming up who he loves scoring against, 13 in his last 10, I think it is. So it was a, a the pragmatic choice from Jurgen Klopp to do that. Or do you think it was it was maybe a little bit too antagonistic? I don't, well, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think Salah was having his best game. I think it's fair to say, and I think Klopp's, but I mean, the, the substitutions that Klopp made certainly made a, a positive impact. I think there was probably an element of, of game management and, I think, you know, even though Salah, he didn't go away for the international break, I think he still is building up his match sharpness and, and you know, trying to find his rhythm again. Um, so I think there's, there's there's a couple of elements. I think the timing of it, I think it was, you know, it was just after Chef, Sheffield United had, had got back in the game. So I think when when you take your big, you, what you would deem your, your best attacker, your, your best player off, when there's a bit of peril, um, it's always going to gonna create a bit of, you know, what's he doing here? Is this the right move? Because... If, if any Liverpool player who's most likely to to break a deadlock or uh, that was on the pitch at that point, it, w- it would have been Salah. We saw it literally days ago against Brighton, um, where he he provides the winner in in a two one, even though he did need about fourteen million shots <laughs> to get to that point. But um, yeah, I think it was one of them, and I think Salah's reaction is is not a surprise because essentially Mo Salah hates being substituted regardless of what the game state is whether it's you know whether it's 5-0 down or 7-0 up he doesn't want to come off the pitch regardless um so it doesn't surprise me and i think you know he, he wants to win this league title as, as much as anyone um and i think when you know that that was his influence gone he wasn't going to be able to affect the game anymore by coming off and and while there's probably you know there is you know big you know it's a very Potentially a very congested fix to this Liverpool, and and given the the injury crisis that they're just about to come out of, you know they don't want any anyone going back into it and and, and creating those problems for them. So, yeah, I think it was one of them when Liverpool win, so it it doesn't feel as big if Liverpool had drawn one one. You know, you I think there'd be a lot more question marks about why you wouldn't have left left Mo Salah on the pitch, but um, ultimately Liverpool did get the job done and 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 that was the main thing. And I think the important <laughs> while the reaction wasn't great, I think. Uh, there's been a few clips doing the rounds on, on Twitter and stuff of um or well, X uh, after you know when Mac- when McAllister scores the goal and he's uh, he's celebrating as much as anybody on the bench so I think that that just shows how much it means to him and it certainly uh you know it does keep a little bit fresher for for Sunday so 
you know, hopefully uh, Liverpool see the benefits of that. And as you say, he certainly loves playing against Manchester United. So hopefully, uh, hopefully he continues that run and, and it makes it look even better. Alexis McAllister is in great form. We obviously saw a great goal against Sheffield United, John. Five goals in his last seven. How vital is he to to Liverpool's operation at the moment? Yeah, really important. Um, I, we, we've just made a video actually on on Liverpool's wide triangle on the right off the back of Liam Tharm's piece in The Athletic. Um, back when Liverpool last won the title in 2019, it, it, it was uh, the same sort of triangle being used, albeit with very different players in that triangle. Um, uh, but yeah, one of those players now is, is Alexis McAllister, who's uh, just pulling the strings, uh, providing passes that can go out wide in behind, as we saw for the winner against Brighton. Uh, as well so yeah he's become a really really important player um no one really knew what to expect from liverpool this season in terms of the fact that they just basically renewed their midfield completely um uh, mcallister coming in on on a fee that we believe to be around 35 million um uh, and that 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 fee just looks incredible from from this point uh, of the season right um so yeah he's been he's been uh, both important not just in terms of uh, scoring the goal that he scored last night obviously but actually becoming quite a creative player for for Liverpool, who actually at, at times I thought struggled a little bit um, creatively last night in terms of being able to generate dangerous chances in the box. Um, but when you have a player like him who can just sort of pop up in the half space, play those those really um, damaging passes in behind um, to, to to the attacking players Liverpool have, then yeah, really, really nice prospect for any manager to have available to them. Mark, I wanted to get your take on on the fixture sort of history between these two sides? Because obviously Liverpool have had a couple of good results against Manchester United. Obviously, at Anfield, we all know about the the 7-0. But in the last couple of seasons, two out of the last three, um, Liverpool have won pretty handsomely, a 5-0 and a, and a 4-2. But on the whole, United, over the last 10 games, have actually had a better record against Liverpool um, in games at Old Trafford. So I suppose it sort of reinforces the fact that Whatever's happening, however chaotic it may seem at United, the standards or the the determination will certainly be raised to get a result in this one. Absolutely, you know this is the one game that everybody looks out for uh, every, every season, and there was a lot of the protests essentially against the Glazers is what I'm trying to say, and um, that really kicked off from there. This whole process that we've been on over the last eighteen months has eventually ended up with Ineos taking a minority stake and, and Jim Ratcliffe being in the building. Um, that day, the atmosphere was one of the better ones that I've experienced at Old Trafford. It only really topped by the FA Cup quarterfinal a couple of weeks ago against exactly the same opponents. Um, Ten Hag has two Old Trafford wins against Liverpool in his two Old Trafford games against Liverpool. And yeah, you're right, for all that we talk about this chaotic style and... Um, just, you know, how fast and direct both teams like to play. I think that does lend itself sometimes to extreme results. Um, you, you said the 7-0 at Anfield, right? Um, it probably doesn't end up 7-0 if United don't offer up the space that they offer up. Uh, the 4-3 that we witnessed a few weeks ago. I went on the Talk of the Devils podcast and made this point and then, <laughs> well, look, I mean... It, I was. It, it, that's what happened. Look, um, I'm trying to. I'm not that I'm Nostradamus or anything, but look, <laughs> it's just you know what to expect from these games. Is what I'm saying. Let's get our predictions then, Mark. We'll start with you. Oh, I don't know. Eight seven. <laughs> 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 well, um, no, I think. Look, seriously, like it's it's tough. I think United will give them a game, but it's difficult to 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 go into it thinking that there's going to be any kind of positive result for Ten Hag. So. Uh, I'd say like 3-1 Liverpool. Okay. Andy? 3-1 was going to be mine as well. I hope Liverpool have learned the lessons of the other week because if they haven't, it's just going to make me even angrier because it still really annoys me, that game. Every time someone <laughs> mentions it, I just get really annoyed. So <laughs> I really hope they don't make me feel like that again. <laughs> and John? Yeah, I don't think they're going to make the same mistakes again. I think it's pretty unlikely. So yeah, 2-0. Two 2-0 nil. Two nil to Liverpool. <laughs> You do it with such disdain. Thank you, John. Um, let's head from the top to the bottom. Okay, so at the bottom of the Premier League, meanwhile, this is how it looks. Bottom three are familiar friends. Sheffield United with 15 points, Burnley with 19, Luton with 22, 
And then above the line, Nottingham Forest with 25. Big win for them against Fulham this week. And then Everton with 26 points. Now, on Tuesday, we saw Dominic Calvert-Lewin score. It wasn't the most convincing penalty, but I think, and as we always say, on a human level, it was great to see someone who's been going through a wretched run of form, 23 games without a goal, scoring. And hopefully this will now give him confidence. And, and you see him as the, the first name on the team sheet now? Yeah, I think it's a, it's worth saying that Everton do have a finishing issue. So they, with all of the strikers they've played regularly this season, they are underperforming their expected goals. Um, so Beto, Yusef Shemiti, who's come on at times as well, and, and Dominic Calvert-Lewin, they're all putting up around the same amount of expected goals per 90. So, you know, it's much of a muchness in terms of uh, the output that, they're, that they are generating for Sean Dyche. But I think what's super interesting about this is that actually if you look at um, Calvert-Lewin's expected goals per 90 across his whole career. This season is the season where he's put up the most uh, in a per 90 sense. So it's 0.54 expected goals per 90 this season, which is, yeah, it's higher than any other season that he's had uh, at Everton um, in the Premier League. So um, these things are always come down to confidence. Um, if you're getting into the right sorts of areas, then you are going to be more likely than not to to, to score more goals. Uh, he's clearly doing that. So the question is whether or not this this penalty, as you're talking about it, is is going to give him the confidence then to start uh, putting up um, actual goal figures to to match his expected numbers. Mark, I wanted to get your take on on how you view the bottom of the table because you're sort of used to hanging out with with teams in loftier heights, you know, Man City and. And Manchester United. Don't speak was... too soon, then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They are, um, United are safe now, though, aren't they? I, I um, think so. <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, Everton, at the moment, effectively, they're just being saved by the fact that it is a substandard bottom three. And I was looking at last season after 30 games, the bottom three were uh, Southampton, Leicester and Forest. And they all had more points than Luton do um, at this stage of the season, last season. So uh, Southampton had 23, Leicester had 25, Forest had 27. Everton, the last two seasons, they finished 16th, 17th. Do you feel just the sort of the way that the footballing gods pan out, that this is the season that they finish below the line? Or do you just think, well, no, it's unfortunately for anyone that wants them to go down, it's just that bottom three are going to save them. Well, I think the, the the point about the bottom three is a is a good one, an interesting one. But I would also kind of flip it a little bit and to say uh, that substandard bottom three being kept in the race by all these points deductions that we're seeing, right? Because look, if 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 Everton had the points that they they originally got, they originally won. If Forest had them, then I think we'd be talking about a bit of a foregone conclusion. And and look, I I think before these points deductions came in, I remember around October November time. Um, there were pieces knocking around and I, I, I largely agreed with them that we already knew who the three relegated was going to be and that this was probably one of the worst relegation races as much as it can ever be a race that that we'd seen in, in the Premier League. Um, equally, I think last season's Leeds, Leicester, Southampton, um, less so Southampton, but but pretty competitive teams who, who you know, were in a, a bad spell, a bad moment last year, but who, and as we've seen from the way that the championship's gone this season, who, you know, are, are Premier League teams in, in, in stature and in, in, in quality of the squad. So I think comparing the two is a little difficult. I would say that, like, from Everton's case, you, sometimes people think, like, sometimes a, a club needs a good relegation. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that <laughs> that's the case with Everton. But, but the way that the club has been managed and the way that, that the club has been run, over the years, um, you know, they've been dicing with death for so long now that you cannot take the type of financial risks and make the type of financial decisions that they've made uh, and leave yourself in a position that puts you in this much jeopardy on a regular basis without ever, um, you know, being in danger of falling under that dotted line, as we say. So it might be the case that this is the season. And I think, look, full credit to, to Luton and the way that they've played, they've really made a fist of it. I think Burnley's form has improved in recent weeks. Um, but points deductions aside, I think that the bottom three will probably stay the bottom three come the end of the season. Pop your um, your Burnley hat on for us, if you don't mind, Andy. Um, 
because at the moment, whisper it quietly, but Burnley are coming into some sort of form, relatively speaking. Uh, they've not lost in four. They beat Brentford. They got points against Wolves, Chelsea and, and West Ham. I know everyone sort of goes on about Luton. And yes, obviously, I have to put the disclaimer in here that I'm a, I'm a Watford fan. But they are, yes, the, the closest to getting out of it. But they're in wretched form. They've lost seven out of their last nine, only one win in, in 13. But it looks as if Burnley are the other side that might, might be able to pop their heads above the line. Are you getting that feeling too? Or, or, or am I misreading it? And they're actually still rubbish. <laughs> well, four on the bounce is uh, unbeaten. Is is like dreamland. Um, it's just not. I don't think. I don't think Burnley had got two games unbeaten on the bounce at any point during the season. Um, so this is just incredible stuff. <laughs> um, I think it it does almost come down to to what happens on Saturday. Um, before we can say yes or no. Now, they there has been belief building that you know Mission Impossible might actually be possible. Um, because it's looked. So so unlikely throughout pretty much the entirety of the season, um. But when Forrest got that points deduction and and Burnley picked up that win against Brentford, um, you know the, the gap was you know it, it was down to sort of four points and um suddenly you looked at it and and uh, and, and thought you know there is a possibility and then they get a a very very unlikely point to Chelsea and we know all know how inconsistent Chelsea can be but to be down to ten men and one nil down, you know that largely this season that would have meant defeats for Burnley but so the, the show and the, the character and the the fight and the spirit that the company's been talking about all season um and they're actually sort of getting getting points now uh the problem is it, it feels like it's just a little bit too late especially with you know in midweek they play well against Wolves argue they, they probably should win it um sort of shade the game but the the gap to to survival goes from four to six because Forest win um and now you know, it may look a little bit rosy if Everton get a points deduction, um, but it won't if they don't beat them on Saturday. Um, so it feels like this is the defining game for Burnley. Um, but they are trending in the right direction. Um, you know, they lost the Bournemouth at home, but they should have won it. Yeah, you know, they had seventy five percent possession with a better team for large for the large portion of it. You know, go away to West Ham, go two up, concede in a, you know in another time, which again is is one of those you look at and think that's. You know that that two points could have been really handy. Um, then they do beat Brentford, you know, and and get the points against get a points against Chelsea and Wolves. So, the 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 signs are right. The problem is is that it could have been you know it would have been helpful if it was five games earlier or ten games earlier, and they'd be right in there. And I know company would uh would tell you that referee and decisions have certainly in you know uh, uh, have a part to play in that. Um. You know, there's been quite a few high-profile ones against Burnley, but ultimately they haven't been good enough and, and sort of deserve to be where they are. Um, the fact that they've got a fighting chance is a bit mad at this point because the points total they're on, they shouldn't have any. Um, so that's why there's this this wild belief I think still there that somehow they are still in this. Um, and if they can win at Goodison Park, then it you know it gives them even more momentum and, and certainly continues to derail Evans um, with that possible point seduction on the way as well. Right, let's get our predictions for this one. Starting with you, Andy. Um, so I'm going to keep me Burnley ass on, even though Burnley played Everton twice this season and got completely bullied by them. Um, so I'm going to go with 2-1 uh, Burnley. I don't know how they're going to do it, but they're going to find a way. <laughs> is this how I'm thinking about it? Because um, they will... The way it's going, they'll probably concede the set piece because they've conceded the same goal against Everton twice uh, in the two games this season. So I'm, I've got to give Everton a goal, but I'm going to somehow, fairly going to somehow find two and hang on. John? 2 0, Everton. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. And Mark? <laughs> I was going to say the same. So I'm going to go, uh, I've got 2 1, Everton. I think, but the, the, Defensively, they've been fairly good this season. I want to say. I don't know if John would agree, but they've been they've been okay. Um, so yeah, two 0 was my preferred score, but I got two one. Okay, we shall see. Right, let's get a quick word on some of the other key games this weekend. Um, Mark Palace against Manchester City. City aren't going to slip up against Palace, are they? Palace are, are even more beige 
than they were under Roy Hodgson at the moment, aren't they? <laughs> I, I'll leave that for Palace aficionados to decide. But um, <laughs> uh, I think that, look, I mean, the reverse fixture at the Etihad was 2-2. And it was, it was a game that was one that City kind of threw away, really, rather than I would say Palace, well, you know, Palace played well enough to, to get the point. But uh, City definitely threw it away. The last, last minute penalty, Michael Olise. Um, and it's, yeah, that the type of opponent that City are prone to throw in a result in sometimes. Um, I remember that game particularly because uh, it was Foden actually who came away with the ball very late and lost it. And then Palace went up the other end and won the penalty. Now, watching that game against Villa the other night, Foden obviously scoring a hat-trick, being at the centre of absolutely everything. And I thought it was interesting as well that that was probably the, one of the better City performances that I've seen recently. And it was a game where they were quite open on the counter-attack. You know, the, the, we we think of Guardiola as someone who's very, um, you know, sets his team up to defend those sorts of, of situations. And don't get me wrong, they were still, but they were more open to it than usual, certainly compared to the game that we saw last Sunday. So I just wonder whether there's a smidgen of a chance of a Crystal Palace counter-attack slicing right through them and maybe making this one difficult. But that's hard to see, really, because, like I say, City were in imperious form the other night and... If we always talk about these runs that they go on and these wins that they they keep picking up, if if they're going to go on one, this might be the start of it. Looking at the way that they played the other the other night, you mentioned Foden, a couple of brilliant goals against um, Aston Villa. He's in exceptional form. And just a quick word to you, John, on on Foden, but also Cole Palmer, who you know we obviously talked about United losing at, at Chelsea, but Palmer, as cool as they come at the moment. And I know that you hate me talking about England when players are performing well for their clubs, <laughs> but, but is there any sort of world where Foden and Palmer are starting England's first game at the Euros? Well, look, England have a huge amount of talent available for them. Um, they're, they're arguably going to have the best midfield in, in world football. So um, yeah, you want to try and fit Phil Foden in there some, somehow um, you've got to displace Jude Bellingham's of the world as well. You've got Declan Rice in there too. So um, there's certainly like a, a, a glut of options for Gareth Southgate to choose from. And it's, it's a nice problem to have uh, being able to pick players of, of that level. But yeah, the, the, those two players, what, what they are is difference makers. And it makes us such a huge, it, it, it gives you such a huge benefit as a, as a team. If you can bring players on like that, where they, they do just turn things um, on its head. Two goals from Cole Palmer late on to actually give, Chelsea a win uh, and then Phil Foden just in incredible I think typified by that goal where he was so angry that he didn't mm. get a free kick that he just decided he was going to score and make yeah. up for it anyway um, and those are the players that win your games and you know people who people like me who 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 focus on the tactics we always have to admit that that at the end of the day tactics are only as good as the players that you have in the positions to be able to benefit from them and um yeah it, I, I think they're it, it's it's really nice watching players like that play because they do give you that sense of you know anything can happen here uh, and and you know that that element of unpredictability whilst in the in the game between Chelsea and Manchester United it represented itself in largely you know bad football it is nice to have players who are able to bring that unpredictability it, and and marry it up with like real quality uh, and at the moment yeah those two just a, a joy to watch playing quick word on um brighton against arsenal and andy i wanted to ask you about um roberto de Zerbi because obviously with the alonso um possibility at liverpool going out of the window i know de Zerbi sort of been mentioned in the in the conversation for for liverpool but he's getting he seems to be getting himself into a bit of a tangle at the moment getting a bit Tetchy, not wanting to sign a new contract, talking about hierarchy at Brighton. He's sort of, I don't know what he's talking himself into, but he doesn't look like anywhere close to being a, a Liverpool manager. No, and I, th I think from our understanding, it would be a, ve a, a pretty big surprise if he if he was announced as Liverpool manager, you know, after after the managerial search. But yeah, he's um, <laughs> he's certainly making the headlines for himself, isn't he, with 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 his comments about certain things and. Um, I mean that that's sort of his personality, though, isn't it? I think we've seen that both on on the touchline and just generally since he, since he's been in England and and some of his his comments, um, particularly about referees, which have, have been quite funny in the past. Um, but yeah, so it is a bit of a strange situation, and um, I think his 
almost his Brighton team are a bit reflective of him, is that you don't quite know what you're going to get when you sort of ask him a question. You don't quite know what you're going to get from Brighton on the pitch um, because they have been pretty... It feels like they've been really inconsistent this season. Like, you, I mean, from, from a Liverpool perspective, put me Liverpool hat back on, you're hoping for a Brighton that, that turned up at Anfield rather than the one who, who played out that draw against Brentford um, in midweek. But... You you just you, yeah you just don't quite know what you're gonna get um, from from the manager or or the the players on the pitch at the minute. And one other uh, quick word on on Luton, who obviously they're trying to get out of the relegation zone. We were talking about Everton earlier on and, and Burnley etc. Um, but they're on a poor run. But that, I suppose they would, in a in a sort of a traditional way, look at Bournemouth as as a possible three points. But this isn't the Bournemouth of old. This is the Bournemouth under Andoni Iraiola, isn't it, John? And this is the Bournemouth that are just four points off seventh. This is the Bournemouth that may well have the manager of the season at their club, is it not? Look, you all laughed at me, but I have to say, <laughs> you aren't laughing now, are you? Um, yeah, it, it, it's been it's been incredible watching um, the turnaround at, at Bournemouth this season under Iraiola. And, and actually, if you look at a rolling XG chart, you can almost see the moment at which the Bournemouth players started understanding what Andoni Areola wanted them to do um, because they went from putting up some very unimpressive numbers across the first nine games of the season to actually now putting up a round, well, form that would put them ahead of Manchester United on the ta- in the table and, and have, have them pushing up towards European, I mean, the Champions League spot. So, yeah, it's 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 been incredible to see that, that turnaround happen. Um, and will be very interesting, I think, to see what happens next season when he's been when he's given another preseason to work with the players, chance to bring in uh, more players that of, of the profile that he thinks can improve the way that he's um, playing. And then uh, balanced off, of course, with the fact that now analysts at all the clubs have had chance to see what his team are up to and and find ways of, of maybe trying to stymie that in some way. So yeah, Bournemouth really really fun to watch at the moment, playing quite a different style of football to um, a lot of the. The football that we see um, re- really uh, working in the Premier League right now, um, and yeah, I'm 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 quite excited to see what what happens in 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 the the following season. Um, this has been a good taster of what we can expect from Andoni Areola. Um, it'd be nice to see like the 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 ceiling, uh, how high that ceiling is next season. That was a great answer, John. Aside from the fact that you use Manchester United as any sort of benchmark for the performance, <laughs> big deal. Yeah. Better exactly. than United, everyone knows. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right, that is all we've um, we've got time for. Uh, really appreciate your time, Mark. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Cheers. And to Andy. No problem. Thank you. And John, once again, good to see you. Yeah, I always love to spend an hour of my day off with you, Adam. It's uh, great. Excellent. You can come round at any time. Um, thank you to you all. Uh, hope you have a good weekend. And IO is going to be back on Monday. Thanks very much for listening. Take care.